Hello out there viewers, listeners, I'm Ryan. I'm Jeff. Welcome to Stirring Up the Leaves, a show where Jeff and I like to have a glass of wine, maybe two. Certainly no more than two. Several glasses of wine. And uh, share some opinions about the wine industry, the wine trade, wine at large, and uh, have a bit of fun with it. On today's episode, we're drinking the same wine twice. Because we couldn't get enough of it. But one bag and box and one in bottle. The ultimate battle. Bib be biddle. Bib be biddle. Last episode, we looked at two of the most popular bag and box wines, products in North America. Specifically, bag and box brands. Bag and box brands. Only available in a box. So now we wanted to do this tasting because I've never done this. Uh, I've never done this. done this. We wanted to compare, see if there was any difference, see if they were targeting a different consumer, see if. There was a bit of variation between the product. Because the important thing to keep in mind is we're talking about the same wine, but with a wine of this production volume, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of liters, presumably. And so it's not like you bottle this in one afternoon at your mom and pop winery. Logistically it, impossible. But we're really bottling this over probably months. I would think so. It was interesting. There's actually like a, a date stamp, a lot number on the bag and box. It's got like 7.36 a.m. It was bottled in May of this year, so. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting to see if, it'd be cool to, to grab a couple boxes throughout the year and compare those as well, see if it, if it changes. changes throughout the year. I mean, presumably with a wine, you know, that has a vintage on it, they're looking for a consistency across lot numbers, yeah. but that's not to say there couldn't be some variation. Also not to say they may tweak it slightly for different formats. When you're making a wine of this production volume. You're looking for a recipe. You're looking for kind of the same flavor profile year in, year out. We're going to start with the bottle version first. And what are we trying today? We're trying La Ville Firm. The old farm. <laughs> the old farm in French. This is uh, the parent company's Famille Perrin. That's right. They're actually part of a kind of an elite group called like the first families of, of wine which is only like 11 families in the EU that uh, have been in the trade for generations. And this is coming from the southern part of France. We're actually in the Rhone Valley. We're actually in an Appalachian. This is from Vento, Vento. Uh, which is in the far southeast corner of the Rhone. And like you'd expect with a lot of Rhone rosés, this is a blend. It's a blend of Senso, Syrah, and Grenache. So we get that beautiful pale salmon color that's so popular, and how does it taste? Tastes like another sip, like another glass. You're definitely in that like kind of berry fruit spectrum. There's strawberries, probably from the Grenache. I'm not sure of the percentages of the blend, but I would say Grenache is a, a forefront here. But I think for me, still quite citrusy. You know, yeah. that kind of like orange grapefruit spectrum, floral. And maybe that's what Senso is bringing to the table. With actually like still some savory kind of pepper notes. And just over $10 a bottle. This is a pretty good deal actually, I think. And what's surprising also is Rosé has a bit of a reputation as a sweeter wine, but I don't think that's the case here. This is, to me, a dry wine. Very dry. I was quite surprised when I tasted it. I, I expected it to be much higher. You can tell it's made in that method where the grapes, the red grapes, are chosen specifically for a rosé wine and not juice that's extracted from right. a red wine ferment or red uh, grapes sitting on skins. Yeah, I mean, so to this quickly is... cover that, so I mean, you have the two predominantly used rosé winemaking methods. So, you know, on the one hand, you have direct press, which is you're taking fruit from the vineyard, throwing it in your press, pressing the juice off right away with maybe a couple hours or a few more hours of skin contact. But unnecessary, you'll, you'll get quite a deep red color uh, straight from the press, and then you'll lose a lot of that during fermentation and aging. And then the other method would be Sonia method, which is you're starting out the process as if you're just making a red wine, but then bleeding, I mean, it comes from the French, the French again, which can translate yeah, uh, everything. Bleeding, bleeding the ferment. And I think the main difference between the two methods would be your pick decisions. On the one hand, direct press, like you said, you're picking the fruit 
with the idea that it's going to be made into rosé. And so rosé, in my mind, should be something that's crisp, refreshing, a little yeah. bit lighter, exactly. and also lower in alcohol. It's a more elegant style of doing mm -hmm. things. And the wineries that are producing it in this method makes you feel like they care a little bit more about it. Well, because you talk to songs, and if you tell a song that a rosé is made in the Sunday method, I'll guarantee that I won't buy it. Because <laughs> it, it kind of just feels like an afterthought when it's made in that way. Yeah. Which is, isn't to say that that's always the case, but oftentimes those wines can be a little heavy-handed, higher in alcohol because they're picking the fruit for a red wine. And let's think of the Rhone as a good comparison. You know, in Southern Rhone, those red wines certainly can push 15% alcohol. Yeah, big wines. Which is not low. And then here we have 13%. Yeah. Yeah, so you'd be extracting juice from a, a potential alcohol tank that was 16% alcohol. All of a sudden you've got a rosé that's way out of balance. You yeah. picked it later so you don't have the same acid profile that you do. So you don't have the crisp finish up. Unless you're adding it. So what we're saying though is we have basically a crisp, refreshing rosé that's made in a fairly serious style. Well, let's try the bag and box and see if there's a difference. We've pulled out the spigot. We've cracked that cardboard. I love that sound. I, I'm not kidding. I, I do love that more than a cork. More than a cork? More than sparkling wine? No. That's okay. not good. Like, like <laughs> Still got carried away. Jesus. Actually, wow, and there's a big difference on the nose. This is definitely more fruit forward. Yeah. Like the citrus is, the citrus is still there, but I, I feel like this is more confected. More red fruit too. Strawberry, which is interesting because I think that goes back a bit to what we said off the top, which is, is there stylistic differences that the winery is aiming for between these formats? And if they decide, we want the bag and box to be a little fruitier. There's obvious steps that they could also do to yeah. work it back. I, I detect a little bit more sweetness on this, a little bit more residual sugar. Right. That's going to lift the fruit a bit more. Absolutely. And this isn't like, this isn't a scientific approach really because we don't know that the wine that we're drinking from the bottle and the wine that we're drinking from the bag and box came from the same tank. Came Could from, be different lots. Came from the same lot, yeah. And the winery actually makes it very easy to see whether there's differences in lot numbers. Right, because the bottle is actually date stamped as well. It's, it's hard to find on some bottles because it's generally towards the bottom of the bottle. The bottle version of this was actually bottled in the start of June, June 8th of this year, 2020. At the winery, to be At the winery. Too. Whereas the box, like we said earlier, uh, bottled in late May. So not a huge, huge difference between when they were bottled. But just reinforces the point that we are talking about different lots, bottled there at different times, and also potentially bottled at different places. Because we know, based on the packaging, the bottle was packaged at the winery, but we don't know where the box yeah. happened to be packaged. They don't, they don't put that, that advertisement on the back label of the box. They don't say it's been bottled at the winery in France. But all we know is that if you like the bottled version of this wine and you go to buy the box, there could be a taste difference. Yeah, I think if you really fell in love with the bottle and then you thought to yourself, man, I could drink, I could drink four liters of that, and you grab a box, uh, you might, you might, be upset. And I think it's also maybe important to say, not that the quality is drastically lower, although I do not like this as much, uh, it's just the style I think that's a little bit more the difference. Yeah. Well, so I guess this kind of leaves us with the question of why, why would a winery go about two different formats for packaging? Well, from a consumer perspective, this is probably appealing to what the industry calls the everyday sipper who's very brand loyal, has wine on a regular, if not everyday basis, isn't necessarily a wine enthusiast or overly interested in learning more, but loves to drink it. And I think if we look at places where Bag and Box is incredibly popular, like in Scandinavia, I think one of it is the consumer factor of why this um, format works so well, but the other is that environmental consideration. Of course, yeah. So I, I looked at a study. It was basically looking at the carbon footprint of a wine 
from the start of a growing season, this is based on established vineyards, mm -hmm. start of the growing season up to the point where it's on a consumer's table and they're having it with dinner. It's actually quite surprising for me to read. So roughly a third, 32% was the production. And that's everything from the start of the growing season up to the minute it enters the bottle. Less than a quarter was in transportation and distribution. Now, granted, this was from the EU to the UK. So, so a relatively short distance. Relatively short distance. But what was the biggest surprise was almost 50% of the carbon footprint was in packaging. And when you say packaging, we're probably looking at the bottle specifically. We're, yeah, 85% of the packaging carbon footprint was the glass bottle. So roughly 40% of the carbon footprint of a bottle of wine. Wow. So a winery doesn't actually use a ton of electricity necessarily throughout the year. Based on the amount of electricity they do use, how many glass bottles could you produce from that? The numbers are kind of hard to, to tie down, but what I looked at, it was roughly like 240 bottles per year. Wow. 240 bottles. When we're talking From the about, amount of electricity that a winery uses throughout yeah, one entire year. That was based on like the average winery in California. So that could be anywhere from 50 to 100,000 cases. Wow. And you were talking about 240 bottles. So the decision to move to something like Bag and Box has an environmental impact, although overlooks the recycling side of things, which we're gonna get into in a subsequent episode. Yeah, uh, you might wonder why I knew that ridiculous question that Jeffrey just posed, is because I did a deep dive. I just assume you're the smartest person <laughs> I know. <laughs> into the, the world recycling trade and how it pertains to wine. And we're gonna do, we're gonna look at some cans and then we're gonna look at all three formats and how they, how they impact the, the globe. Because the results actually are a little surprising. Absolutely. Kind of like this tasting. You know, I think we went into this expecting to not see a big difference between glass bottle versus bag and box. We actually found a surprising difference. I think we both liked the bottle a little bit more. Could we recommend it? Could we like... A stirring up the least recommendation? A, st a seal of approval. Yeah, we could stamp that seal. Stamp it. Because we, we went through a lot of rosé on the beach this year. La Ville Firm never was one of those rosés. And uh, this price really over-delivers in yeah, my mind. I think it's safe to say next year it will end up on the beach. So give it a try, pick it up, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, now it's time for that shameless plug, I guess. Hit the subscribe button. Hit that like button. Hit that alert. Hit that bell. Hit the bell, ring the bell. So you'll be notified of all the latest videos. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.